has experience in the funeral home business. He has experience with veterans and experience here in the city of Charleston. Now, Herbert S. Fielding wants to bring all of those experience to the Charleston County Coroner's office. He tells me exclusively why he's running for Charleston County Coroner for this edition of Quentin's Close-Ups. And if you haven't already, subscribe to my YouTube channel and follow me on social media. Herbert S. Fielding, welcome back to Quentin's Close-Ups. <laughs> Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, and you? I'm doing just great. <laughs> so, you know, we are sitting in an iconic location here in downtown Charleston, which is your family's business, uh, feeling home for funerals, that is. Obviously, you're one of the owners of this particular business. And now, and we all know that you work for Merrill Riley, you have veterans administration experience and other experiences around town. But now I understand you want to run for Charleston County Corner. Mm -hmm. Tell me why Herbert Fielding, why Charleston County Corner? Well, it is something that I have experience in. Um, my, I am um, a manager. I've been uh, an executive manager for probably 20-some years in state government. State government. Um, and this is a position that I am um, familiar with, very familiar with, and I feel that I can contribute to this, this position because at this point, um, the current coroner's office is... Uh, not as accessible or as transparent or diverse as it should be um, for the to serve the community. What should people be familiar with when it comes to the Charleston County Coroner's Office in your mind, as far as transparency and I think accessibility? That, I think that a lot of the data collected and the information that's gleaned is not being used to prevent death. Um, because you've got several groups that, you know, that you've got drug problems, you've got food issues, um, and also, you know, just basic education on diet and, and, and lifestyle. And that information comes from the studies that are done by the coroner's office, the medicological data that right. comes from the coroner's office. Um, but right now that data is not as free-flowing as, as it should be. I mean, you know, there's a there's a sign, you know, my brother ran the morgue right. over at MUSC right. for what, about 16 years. Um, there's a sign that says, you know, this is where the, the dead teach the living um, on the outside of the door. And I think that's something that we need to do with the information that's being gleaned from the coroner's office. What will you teach the community about the Charleston County Coroner's Office? As much as I can, I, I would I would make it as open as possible. Now you understand that there are certain things that you cannot discuss with respect to medical right. information, but whatever can be learned from the data that is collected should be made into presentations and taken to the community. To the community. Let me get back to you. Obviously, you talked about obviously the feeling home for funerals and obviously your experience in the community. Yeah. <laughs> How has your experience as a funeral director in Obama prepared you to become potentially the next Charleston County Corner? I think that it's it's not exactly the track that a whole lot of people take. Um, the funeral service, um, of course, requires that one be familiar with death or with deceased persons. Um, so that is out of the. I've taken care of that. I I can you know I, I'm not. I'm not, I don't have an aversion to the process. I understand it. I've seen it since I was a child. Um, so what I would like to do is, is to, at least to automate the process from the standpoint of the investigators also, so sure. that it's easier to collect the data and get the data into a system that can then be made to report worthy. Um, and, you know, any of the deputies or any of the investigators should be able to present in their particular specialty um, to the community so that we can take it out. And also, if you have gone on their web page, it, it, it's not very interactive. How interactive would you make that data available to the community? That which can be public information would be available so that people can study and look at it and use the data to make decisions because not only do we not only would the, the coroner's office do presentations, but people could get their information from the website and then use it to present to the community. Obviously, we're sitting here at funeral, funeral building home for funerals. Yeah, we are. And I'm pronouncing it wrong, <laughs> as always. But 
Herbert, do you feel like you running for corner or and potentially becoming corner could be a conflict of interest? No, no, no. Uh, all across the state of South Carolina, there's several funeral directors that are the coroners in small towns, smaller towns. It, it, it doesn't have a, the coroner doesn't recommend any person to a given place. It, the coroner's not even involved in that process. That that choice, I don't see where there would be a conflict of interest um, because the coroner is not involved in the process of a funeral service. Let me turn over to a couple of newspaper headlines. This is from the Hill newspaper. New York City nursing home forced to use a refrigerator truck for coronavirus victim bodies, as told Nair 100. This is another headline from the New York Times. We ran out of space. Bodies piled up as New York struggles to bury its dead. This is another New York Times headline. Dozens of decomposing bodies found in trucks at a Brooklyn funeral home. Unrefrigerated Un trucks. Yes, sir. If this God forbid happened in Charleston County and you were cornered today, what type of integrity would you use in this particular situation? Well, it, as to with respect to having the police power to be able to regulate what a funeral service does. Now, that is the Board of Funeral Service that would be directly responsible for what happened at a given funeral home. And, and that, that would be, you know, from that board. Um, the burial process takes time. Of course, um, you want to embalm as soon as possible. Sure. Um, if you're not, you know, if the funeral's next week, yeah. I got to be able to keep the person. And normally, that's in a refrigerated situation. Sure. So those funeral directors who had, you know, such a, a large influx of, of deceased persons um, didn't have the storage capacity, and they were doing what is proper by getting the refrigerated trucks and putting the bodies in there. Now, that, that one funeral home in Bronx, and I saw it, that uh, put bodies in an unrefrigerated truck is probably going to lose a license because that was completely, that, that just doesn't go along with any of the, the uh, you know, the, any of the teachings of the funeral service. Um, it was disrespectful. Um, and what teachings from the funeral service would you bring to the coroner's office for this type of situation? I think the most important thing is compassion. Um, you know, you're dealing with people that have just had about the worst thing they're ever going to have happen. Somebody is deceased. So you got to be uh, careful with your words and, and your actions to, to, to comfort them. Comfort them. I know early in the interview, you talked a lot about, you know, obviously the community. And I know that obviously as corner, you said that you will lead the office to meeting, meeting the expanding needs of the growing county. What needs are available right now for this county that can be expanded? I think that the first thing is the transparency of the coroner's function. You know, the, the coroner's job comes all the way from the 1600s. <laughs> um, the coroner was to re really was the person who would report on what the sheriff did. Right. Uh, Al Cannon has got no fear of me <laughs> whatsoever. But, you know, the, the, that that particular attitude was at a period of time when there weren't doctors and all kinds of stuff. But now when you come to 2020, we have a medical examiner now. Um, so you're gonna get the scientific reason, the, the manner and the cause of death mm. from the medical examiner. Right. The police are gonna do their investigation in some kind of a crime scene right. situation. Um, most of the coroner's services are to natural causes deaths. Mm. Um, and the coroner will either request an autopsy if it's a young person um, and they die suddenly, mm -hmm. they'll request an autopsy. But most of the time, it's really just to make sure that there's nothing glaringly evident that requires investigation and then moving on um, the process. The process. And what should that process be like right now? What other processes would you use? Well, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I think the, the big concern in everybody's mind is COVID-19. Sure. Um, Follow science. Uh, I'm, I, I don't. I have no credentials whatsoever with respect to being able to dictate or even to suggest any kind of different function than following the scientists and, and following the process to try and come up with a, a, a virus. Um, a, you know, a, 
what I'm talking about, the back show. Sure. Oh, yes, yeah. exactly right. Yeah. And I know that obviously your father, Herbie, you fielding helped write the bill that has helped prevent the spread of communicable diseases by requiring proper labeling of posthumous patients. What proper label would this office use for coronavirus if you're cornered today? Well, coronavirus is a communicable disease. And H.U. wrote the bill that basically dealt with the fact that you were getting AIDS cases, you were getting TB cases, right. um, communicable diseases, and they were not identified. And that's a danger to the embalmer because um, at that point in time, he doesn't doesn't know that he has a communicable disease in front of him. Now, over that time period, when what an embalmer would do now is treat every person that comes through the door, every deceased person that comes in, as if they are communicable, and just taking the proper PPE, the shield, right. and the mask and gloves, um, the special gloves that right. you use. Um, <clears throat> the other side of this question is, is the, uh, what they call type 1 Mary, the yeah. person who does not exhibit any kind of uh, symptoms. Mm. That that person is always in the process. So that's why HU wrote that bill, which now anytime there's a communicable disease, the wrapping that the mold will put on the body has a red tape that mm. goes around it and lets you know immediately that you're dealing with a communicable disease. Wow. I know, obviously, you said this quote, I'm running for Charleston County Corner to basically bring our culture of service to the office. I have experience and ability to lead the corner's office to meet the expanding needs of our growing county. What's your definition of culture of service? Well, I, I think I'm, first off, I'm a participatory kind of manager. I like to be in the mix and, and I follow um, this, as I showed you earlier, um, my grandmother, Actually, in Lincolnville, South Carolina, they used to have meetings of the Pullman workers on the trains, mm. um, which later on became NAACP. Mm. They met in their home because, of course, they couldn't sure. publicly meet. Right. Yeah, not right. at that time. Right. Um, that legacy comes from my grandfather and my father. Yeah. Um, serving the community basically means that they assess what I have as information and talk to the community which means, you know, having a diverse team to go out and find out what the community needs and, and, and then being able to present that information to the community. This is a public agency. This is a $2 million public agency. Um, it needs to serve the public. <laughs> that's, that's a very, you know, that's a basic idea. Public service requires service to the community. Sure. And so, you know, I mean, I would bring that attitude to the table and try to convince my team that that's what we need to do. And I know that you say, quote, I will work hard to be a representative of the underserved members of the community by addressing the issues that disproportionately affect them, unquote. What are those issues right now when it relates to the coroner's office? Well, I think that, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a myriad of information being collected by the coroner's office. You've got an investigator on scene for, and the very evident Things that we see out there, the drugs. Oh yeah, um, you know, drugs that tan up the community. Gun violence. Um, gun violence is a difficult issue, but it still should be addressed, and we should should be able to, to educate the community on what effect it's having. And I think that one of the things that, especially being in the South, right. is our diet. <laughs> um, you know, we're we the We've got more diabetes, we've got more heart problems, we've got, you know, and look at what's happening with COVID right, right now. The comorbidity things are, are, are what's actually hurting 40% of the people that are dying are African Americans. <laughs> um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture, but it, it really brings to the forefront our need for education. And healthcare. And healthcare. Mm -hmm. And how would you also work with the Charleston County Probate Court, for instance? I, I want to, the, the big question between the, the courts and the coroner is the fact that the coroner can have an inquest. And any number of legal persons have a problem with that. Um, if it's a controversial situation that the community is really clamoring for, for information, 
I would go forward with an inquest. But it would most of the time that's an unnecessary process. It does not happen on any regular basis. Um, I will. I I would work with the courts um, as the legal arm sure, sure. of the process. Um, the inquest is not an accepted legal process. It's it's a it's a it's a dictated process by the, the statute that the, the public can ask for a description or be able to participate in evidence um, of a death, um, most likely being something of a questionable nature or something. Okay. Um, so you you know I can't deny that to I can't I can't <laughs> excuse me just at the off. I, I couldn't deny the public their their exposure to that. Yeah. But it, 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 at this point, I would tell you that I would work with the courts as the legal entity involved. You talk about, you know, obviously that process. What should that process be like? Well, that the, the, the probate court and the uh, general sessions courts, right. that, all of that functions on its own. I mean, you know, the, the prosecution has the. Um, you know, they can indict someone, they can take you before the grand jury and indict you. Right. Subpoenas and also the legal questions that they have. The coroner does have the ability to subpoena people and that kind of stuff. But it, but the bottom line is it's it's not a function of the judicial system. It's a function of the coroner's office, which is totally different. Right. And you all said this too. There is a back current backlog in the existing coroner's office. And if we are understaffed, now then that becomes a problem, and that problem will only exacerbate. The administration makes all of the, all of the difference. How far back is that backlog in your mind, Herbert? I I, I have it on very good um, authority that backlog was handled um, in the past. The, there was a backlog. If you go on the coroner's site right now, the the information that you see is from almost 2013. That was handled. There's additional funds have been put in to the budget for people to, to bring in additional resources. Um, and as I understand from a very good source that the, the, the backlog um, was taken care of by the current uh, coroner, that, that has been handled. But the, the uh, funds are there in the 2020 budget to be able to um, expand the office because, of course, the county has grown. Yes. The number of people have grown right. considerably. Um, so it, it, it was a, you know, I, I think that is out of the way. That's that's not a question. What's the question in your mind now? I think the biggest thing is the transparency and the diversity in the office. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a little difficult for some of us to enter enclaves of people um, that were not exactly um, of the same culture. And that's trying to put it as nicely as I possibly can. But the reality is to, I probably would have more access in some areas than, you know, someone Caucasian would have in, in, in certain areas um, and have a little more recognition because they would know me. Um, so diversity and, and of the force of investigators is, is required. Right. And you talk about obviously those funds in, in the 2020 budget. How much of those funds would you use to go out in the community and actually educate these people? I would I would use the, well, when you think about it, how, how many deaths are there? Mm. So there's got to be some time in the day mm. that could be devoted to outreach. And I'll call it outreach. Sure. Yeah. At this point, but um, that should be a part of job description. Outreach. Outreach. Mm -hmm. And I know obviously what you'll do on day one. What exactly would you do on day two if you're a coroner? <laughs> I I think I probably do a lot of what I started on day one. <laughs> I, <laughs> I keep going. Um, day two is going to be. Um, I I want to assess and audit. The process sure. that, that's and and that's only fair to those persons who are existing is to get a a real view of what is is going on. What what are we doing, and 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 what do we need to do? What can we change? What can we change? Right. 
And what would you change about the Charleston County Coroner's Office in five, ten years from now? <laughs> well, I think that if if I'm elected coroner, I'm going to put a process in place that's going to make it a little different. Um, it, I really think that it needs to concentrate. The information needs to be used to better the community and to help the community. So um, in five or ten years, I mean, you know, ten years ago, you didn't have a tablet. <laughs> you know, we want we want beepers and, and right. yeah, you know, so my ability to be able to go into the future that far is, is probably limited but I, I do think that that automation is going to be one of the things that I would push up almost immediately and automation from the level of investigators back through the database back to the database and collect, collect. okay mm -hmm. well Herbert S. Fielding, thank you so much for your time. And again, welcome back to Quentin's Close Ups. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. <laughs> yeah.